Uh, it's a pleasure for us to welcome Professor Oscar Guardiola at SER, uh, whom we met long, long time ago when we didn't have white bears and we were younger. Uh, I'm joking. That's I have to say, this is the first time I've been called old. No, we are not old. You are ma <laughs> As we say in, Port in Mozambique, we are people with knowledge. If you are too young, it means that you are not really someone accountable for. So I'm talking from the perspective of someone established with ground, solid knowledge, someone would call an elder, not an older, but an elder. That's very prestigious from my location. Good. You can actually can be an elder with 15 or 16 years. It depends on knowledge you have accumulated. So uh, Professor Oscar Guardiola has been in touch with several research projects and activities at, at SERS. Actually, I met him when Boaventura Souza Santos discussed the research project in Colombia on the Kaleidoscope of Justice. Mm -hmm. It was a very interesting project on legal pluralism and the idea of the Colombian nation. That is something that I think it's a subject that we share all along in terms of research, research interest. Professor Oscar Guardiola is currently uh, at law school at Brubeck College where he teaches constitutional law, uh, law rights, films, culture. Whatever so, I can to pretend that I know anything. <laughs> what I think it's very interesting is that he actually uses law as a corner to enter into question contemporary issues that are at core of our interests. So it's for us a pleasure and a challenge to our perspective since we have here students that, and colleagues that come from different areas of work at SER, from post-colonial studies, from other areas of social science, human rights and so on. So Professor Oscar Guardiola suggested to talk about his most recent research and publication, the story of a death foretold story de uma morte anunciada, the coup against Allende in Chile in September 1973. Initially, yes, it's a big Shameless thing, of a big, publicity. A big thing, solid, heavy piece of research. Uh, it's, I, it's initially suggest, he proposed the title of his presentation in English. I'm not sure which language you'll be using from now on. He can speak in Spanish, Portuguese or in English. Feel free. It's up to you. But without further presentation, because to talk about what could be sitting here endless discussing the important work he has been doing. But I give you uh, thank you very much. You have, after your presentation, will be discussing. Good. Well, thanks very much, Paula. And uh, I should begin by asking for your forgiveness. I'm uh, going to uh, uh, speak in English and follow the text in the interest of time. This is a uh, monologue uh, accompanied by a uh, what I call a mini installation uh, and uh, two videos and uh, the total runtime of the presentation should be uh, around 55 minutes which is uh, asking a lot from you uh, and uh, I am going to burden you even more uh, uh, by speaking in English rather than giving you my very horrible portuñol uh, my 13-year-old uh, daughter lives in, in Rio de Janeiro and she correctly always uh, tells me Dad, you should stop uh, <laughs> speaking your horrendous portuñol, let me do the talking. Uh, that's what 13-year-olds uh, uh, should do. Uh, so, uh, without any further ado, uh, this uh, is um, a piece that accompanies my latest uh, book title is Story of Death Foretold. Of course, there are resonances of Garcia Marquez there, but I'm a much worse writer than he is, uh, so I have to write door stoppers, really big <laughs> ones. You can use them in order to defend yourself, stop the door, or maybe uh, 
uh, read it. Uh, hopefully, it will be translated into Portuguese at some point. I do, I do hope so. Uh, even though the uh, 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 limits of uh, the publishing industry these days are making things a lot more difficult. So thank you very much for being here. Can we turn off the lights? Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Don't watch. Close your eyes. Can you hear them? As the sound of Hawker Hunter combat yet no diving on the presidential palace. The place is Santiago de Chile. The 11th of September 1973. You're inside the palace. You had dreams. You joined the revolution. Now they're coming for you. This is the end. Soon as the rockets hit the edifice, the ground will open under our feet. Now imagine we're falling, but there is no ground. This is a thought experiment, also a visual experiment. Now open your eyes. Contemporary philosophers and visual artists, uh, we can turn on the lights if, we, if you want to, tell us we can no longer assume any stable ground on which to base metaphysical or foundational political claims. Were this to be the case, the implications for art, uh, philosophy and law, also sociology, would be considerable. All I want to do today is to tease out with you some of those implications. Philosophy, art, law and politics, but also, as I pointed out, the sociology of protest and representation, including strands mindful of the post-colonial situation, have been obsessed with ground and origins, with authenticity and purity for quite some time. The idea that people sprung from the earth itself are the original inhabitants of a country, as opposed to foreigners and strangers, is perhaps as old as history itself. Consider, for instance, the following oration of uh, Panegyricus. Uh, Isocrates tells his fellow Athenians in the oration, we did not become dwellers in this land by driving others out of it, nor by finding it uninhabited, nor by coming together here a motley horde composed of many races. The implication here is that the first person plural could only be properly attributed to and used by, here I quote Isocrates again, we of a lineage so noble and pure that throughout our history we have continued in possession of the very land which gave us birth, since we are sprung from its very soil and are able to address our city by the very names which we apply to our nearest kin. Isocrates', Isocrates point is that because the land endures, as well as our connection with it, there is a we each and a we together. Put otherwise, there is no cut between the land and the identity of a, of a people, no cut in the lineage, no montage. What I'm going to call the denial of montage, no cut, no addition, but purity or, uh, of lineage, is the common theme between old and modern forms of declaring uh, or establishing the first person, we each and we together. The difference between classical appeals to soil and origin, such as Isocrates's, and modern appeals to authenticity based on geographical, racial and class thinking, is that only in the latter 
the legitimacy of a people to rule over a territory is understood to presuppose the absence of other peoples from that territory. There can be no admixture, and the uh, only possible coexistence would be one based on distinction and difference, but no articulation and no montage. Other peoples must, must either assimilate or be gone. Alternatively, their bodies and a specific genealogy can, perhaps must, be erased from the face of the earth so as to purify the legitimacy claim of a ruling people. Society is seen in this perspective as a whole, as grounded, closed, pure. Again, there is no need for articulation. All you need is the additive compilation of interests and voices resulting in the voice of a people. Notice that this approach to the social is completely analogous to a standardized language of form in which the different statements are thus transformed into a chain of formal equivalences, which adds the political demands together in the same way that pictures and sounds are strung together in conventional or uh, uh, corporate, uh, uh, corporate media. The roundness, unevenness and conflicting or contradictory nature of political demands is thereby flattened. In this approach, what is missing is mediation, plasticity, or in the language of visual and electronic uh, media, which I am consciously using here, cut, addition, and articulation. What takes the place of mediation and articulation is addition of interests and or desires and or voices. Modern appeals to uh, uh, legitimate authenticity and purity follow an aesthetic form of concatenation and political addition. The latter, concatenation and addition, grounds the former, the legitimacy of purity and authenticity. Crucially, such purified or grounded legitimacy and point of view as a people can be projected over the entire earth as the very standard measure or norm for apportioning terrestrial global space. In modernity, the grant of legitimacy is no longer simply being of the space, but rather being in this or that space unimpeded by others, which are either added, standardized, flattened, or absent. On the one hand, this means that the new ground for legitimacy is no longer local, but actually translocal. The people claiming legitimacy to rule relates to the rest of the world as if it were presented to them. Let us call this the metropolitan approach to locality, in which what cannot be seen, for it is too far, marginal or peripheral, is brought within sight. Notice that, metropo that metropolitan people must be one that remains largely the same not only in spite of, but rather because they move from their initial locality to another. On the other hand, this means that any other locality, ultimately the rest of the world, must either be uninhabited or be made such. The rest of the world can only be offered to a people, presented to them, claimed by a people, or brought within sight in the absence of all other peoples. The ground of legitimacy becomes then the obliteration of all others who appear as an obstacle in the horizon. This is the point made by Diego Velázquez in his painting Christopher Columbus offering the world to his Catholic majesties. I will interpret this painting as if it were the same inspired image that Cuban author Alejo Carpentier conjured up in his novel, The Harp and the Shadow. Look at the scene. We look at the scene in Velazquez's painting as if we were contemplating the skies themselves. Notice that the perspective is, is, is upwards. You're obliged to look at it as if you were looking 
from below, you're looking effectively at uh, the skies in all their glory and perfection. In fact, we're looking at the sphere of the heavens, the cosmos uranos of ancient times, which is to say that we're looking at beauty itself. This is the order of creation and divine law, God's view and thought. As you know, the geometrical roundness of the cosmos has signified, since classical Greece, the totality of what exists presented in the stimulating image of an all-encompassing sphere. That's precisely what, uh, we are, what Velasquez is presenting there. But in his painting, as if it were an act of magic, Cosmos and Uranus have been reduced to the size of an orb, which can be seen at the very center of uh, uh, the canvas. And Columbus is presenting the orb to their Catholic majesties. So the very moment God reveals the glory of his creation to the human inheritors of the Roman, uh, the sacred Roman Empire, the sky and the earth blur into one another in a chain of equivalences, the same horizon. The process of addition and concatenation referred to before. And the mystery and obscurity of transcendence is no more. Everything that is visible on the surface of the earth can now be seen. The painting is filled with uh, 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 you know, the peoples of the earth, the entities of the heavens, and they are now one and the same, but the trick is only possible if you place your vision at the very center, at the level of the horizon. That's precisely what, uh, where the throne of uh, their Catholic majesties is placed. That's the ground. And on the very ground, uh, uh, Columbus is presenting the entirety of uh, uh, creation. Uh, again, the mystery of God and the mystery of creation is no more. It can be had, it can be presented, it can be possessed. Beauty, truth and perfection have become attainable, ready at hand, not just an object of contemplation. At the hand of a prince, that is, acting on behalf of his people and purifying his people in and through the act of adding to it the rest of the world, which is homologous to taking possession of beauty, goodness, truth, and perfection. The painting is full of light, which contradicts later representation of conquering Iberia as still in the darkness of superstition. The latter are part and parcel of the so-called black legend through which later colonizers, Anglo-Saxon colonizers, justified uh, their additive enterprise as more benign. We'll see a cinematic example, a 20th, uh, 20th century cinematic ex example of uh, uh, this very same frame of vision later on. Uh, but for now, let us uh, uh, agree that what we see in Velasquez's painting is the light of reason, not superstition. As the sun rises in the horizon and peoples, the entire world of peoples are added. They are within the frame and the field of, and within the field of vision. A certain, let us call it northern enlightenment, is already present or at least announced in Velasquez's painting. But it seems to me that the framing of the scene in the painting also invites the spectator to wonder what is left outside of the frame. Every painting follows, at least uh, since uh, the Renaissance follows the same trick, framing, shooting an object. So whenever you frame anything, and here the intention is to frame the entirety of the world, the totality of the world, the question is itself uh, uh, invited and positive. What remains outside of the frame? Enticingly, we're also witnessing the very moment in which the South was invented. I believe Velasquez's painting is inviting us to criticize this method of the mere addition of demands, entities, desires, peoples, resulting in the voice of the people and or uh, standard desire and the presentation of the entire world, what we now call globalization. But I do not want to read too much into uh, the painting. 
let me then appeal to Carpentier's 1970s uh, uh, The Harp and the Shadow. The, no the novel reminds us of the dark side, if this is light, the dark side of this invention of the South, the shadow, if you like, of Velasquez's otherwise extraordinarily lighted painting or what is outside uh, its framing. Here is Columbus in the novel, not only as a great navigator but a hypocritical con artist, introducing a slavery as human gold by a sleight of hand. He confides to himself but not to his confessor, and here I quote Carpentier, and so, having tried to substitute the flesh of the Indies for the gold of the Indies, seeing that I could obtain neither gold nor flesh to sell, I began, apprentice of a prodigious mag magician, to substitute for gold and flesh words. Great, beautiful, weighty, juicy, rich words, raising the brilliant court of wise men, doctors, prophets, and philosophers. That's precisely the, the, uh, Velasquez's painting. Not having found the mine that their highnesses considered so important and longed for so intensely, I use magic to make them see that not all that shines is gold. The 40-year-old Quinn, the same age as Columbus, succumbs to his bag of wonders, my hallelujahs of dazzling geographies. As Carpentier puts it, the captain and the Queen seduce each other. As they make love, she promises him all the ships he needs. At daybreak, the caravels go up in smoke. Angrily, Columbus complains. I felt that I was the equal of any monarch and was just as important, for though I lacked a jeweled crown, I wore the aura of my great idea. The way they wore the crowns of Castile and Aragon. After a shouting match in which they both call each other pigs, the queen, you know, a, a, a term that has returned uh, uh, in uh, uh, contemporary language, as they call each other pigs, the queen gives into his plea for three caravels. She borrows millions from private bankers to outfit his expedition, expecting gold in return. Notice the, the analogy between the, the uh, uh, act of navigation and the financial idea of return and profit. They have one and the same origin. Gold in return, so she, the queen, and her people can carry on their wars, their additive enterprise, and continue to live in splendor. We may be witnessing the end of that glorious era. But instead of gold, Columbus encounters only half-naked Indians, us, in the New World. The discovery and global exploitation of silver and gold, mountains of it, in fact, will come later on the back of transatlantic slavery and indigenous genocide. Its final cause, money. Money, I must tell you, is the strangest thing, halfway between object and the supreme subject or theological idol, flattening the roundness of the world into a horizontal line projected onto the horizon and, and or onto a screen and viewed as one and the same by a 16th century navigator or a 21st century finance broker in New York, London, or Hong Kong. They are both imagining the nervous system of Mother Earth. If this isn't magic, what is? Carpentier, who coined the term magical realism, asks. Gold is a wonderful thing. Its owner is master of all he desires. Gold can even enable souls to enter paradise. These words of incantation attributed to Christopher Columbus and dated 1503 sum up the worldview that collided with Andean civilizations in the 16th century. That worldview distinguished between symbols and their places of inscription. Gold, for instance, became the universal incarnation of value, and this is precisely the same uh, gesture that we witness in Velasquez's painting. Only through abstraction can you uh, totalize the entirety of the world and then inscribe it into a solid basis, in this case the orb. The orb is the totality of the universe. 
But in order to make that, that uh, uh, possible, to present the world, you must first abstract the entirety uh, of the world. The sign becomes, uh, 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 let's say, uh, separated from uh, its place of in inscription in the same way as the identity of a people has become separated from the soil. So gold, for instance, became the universal incarnation of value. Holding on to gold meant being able to transform everything else into a valuable relation. The whole world could then be mapped, turned into an orb in such terms, and made more or less valuable. Thereafter, things, places, and peoples had no significance of their own, but only relative value. This principle, which sees the object of the world merely as a set of relative values with not, no significance of their own, uh, which, by the way, here I'm thinking about Paula's work, which, by the way, mm, grounds uh, accusations of feticheria when, when it comes to uh, other knowledges and other peoples. So this principle, which sees the objects of the world merely as a set of relative values with no significance of their own, had assisted the transit from textuality, textuality, the imbrication with, with the earth, a, being, being, uh, uh, being uh, um, part of a tejido. How do you say that in Portuguese? A fabric. Had assi uh, so this, uh, this principle assisted the transit from textuality to alphabetic writing in postal make, map making, book worshipping, money hoarding societies of uh, Renaissance Europe. The same principle operative in the act of writing and or painting or navigating, and it is the same principle, uh, the act of writing and navigation and the making of maps was at work in the establishment of a form of wealth always ready to be held and used. Maps, tables and circles, it should be remembered, not only refer to geometrical or technical concepts as they did in ancient times, but also have social connotations as a circumference <laughs> containing people who share certain goods, certain kinds of information or added interests. The circle calls up another concept crucial in understanding objects. Objects may, as commodities, circulate within spheres or circuits by which they are determined or valued and which they determine. This point can be generalized if we pay closer attention to the connection or contradiction between writing and monetary value, on the one hand, and textum, including textiles, the fabric of society and textuality and community on the other. The suggestion here, this is my very modest suggestion, is that spatial distribution, taxonomic classification, and anthropological speech and writing, uh, laying the groundwork for sociological speech and writing, what may be called the scientific collecting of objects, has always been entangled in a complex net of purposes, practices, and processes. And this is nothing original, of course. Not the least economic and expansionist purposes, whose common denominator was the emerging form of market relations and commodity exchange across the globe. This is the story of how globalization was invented uh, in Latin America during the 16th century on the back of the appearance of the first world money, the silver peso, and the greed of conquistadors. Now, there are countless tales of the greed of conquistadors and colonizers, and their lust for precious metals and territorial power is well known. But only rarely is the important question of the reasons for, for such lust posited, let alone put to rest. Only with the possibility of keeping hold of, social, of socially produced value and with the extension of commodity circulation is it that the lust for gold awakens. When value, place, difference and significance can be abstracted and inscribed on a solid basis, again, Columbus's presentation, only then it can be transferred and accumulated in the form of wealth or information. 
What is being described here is the same procedure of addition and concatenation that I referred to before. This procedure also permits the subordination or obliteration of objects corresponding to other forms of communal organization and exchange or knowledge misunderstood or experienced as dangerous or archaic. Out, out of this procedure to circulate and add abstraction emerges the potentially infinite circulation of objects within circuits of value and their transformation into signs, one of which, the most familiar to us, is money. The latter can take the shape of coins or later on squares of paper with little graphic signs printed upon them. In this respect, at least, we must understand that from here onwards there is more than a family resemblance between money, books and maps. Indeed, circles, tables and squares also call up another concept crucial to the understanding of modern societies characterized by the incessant movement of objects around the globe. Coins, money, the gold fetish, the silver peso, coexisting side by side with orbs, which were also known as circuits, maps, tablets, codes, and thereafter legal systems and fixed international borders. They all belong to the same category of things being placed by means of signs and symbols that we, today, like yesterday's conquistadors and the first ethnographers and adventurers, mistake for wonders. Crucially, this mistake, what I have been describing as an optical illusion, a sleight of hand, a form of magic, mistaking signs for wonders or the horizon line for a stable ground, is what grounds the stability of a people as it travels from locality to locality, adding soil and capital in the process. Let me give you two examples two concrete examples, two historical examples, which come from each of my previous two books. The first from uh, uh, what if Latin America ruled the world? And if you're wondering what is the answer, it's very simple. We would all dance better. And the second from my most recent story of a death foretold. First example. On 5th August 1495, Christopher Columbus received from a royal cosmographer, uh, uh, received a letter from royal cosmographer Jaume Ferrer de Balmes an almost unknown figure, uh, but one of incredible significance, as you will see. The letter, addressed to the Admiral of the Ocean, Sea and Discoverer of Worlds, came at the request of none other than Her Catholic Majesty, Queen Isabella of Spain. The Queen was anxious, as Carpentier uh, puts it, about the apparent lack of progress in the enterprise of the Indies delivering the desired returns, profits. And no one was better placed than Ferrer to take up the issue. Ferrer was one of Spain's foremost geographers and cosmographers, having proposed to the crown a method for establishing the longitude of the meridian drawn in the mid-ocean, which is the same, is the same optical illusion. The same optical illusion that gives you the, that gives you the spectator, and you, as all the spectators, are either thieves or traitors. Uh, the same ground that gives you the illusion that they are, you know, that, that they are uh, well grounded and sitting and sitting on the thrones. Uh, uh, the same technique was used by Jaume Ferrer and others to uh, uh, calculate in the middle of the ocean uh, a an imaginary line, which would then serve to divide the world. And in fact, to now we're into uh, legal legal s law speech uh, to resolve the conflict. Uh, in the crucial, between Spain and Portugal, in the uh, crucial 1494 Treaty of Tordesillas, an achievement recognized today as an example of mathematical and geographical genius. It helped, as I just uh, suggested, solve a major dispute between Spain and Portugal, the two most powerful navigational powers of the age, which the legal document addressed concerning the distribution of the New World, which until then as, and here I'm quoting someone, didn't exist uh, after Columbus's momentous discovery. Crucially, always the Renaissance man, Ferrer was almost as good at, con as, uh, at conducting business, trading gems, gold and silver in the Levant, as he was applying 
his mind to intractable cosmographical problems and international legal conflicts. During his dealings in the region, in the Levant, he had learned from Indians and Arabs and Ethiopians, this is, uh, I'm quoting him, the, the letter, that precious metals and stones and all manner of good things often come from very hot regions whose inhabitants are black or dark, or dark brown. His observation on the unique nature of place, climate, peoples and the goods to be found in each different location was to have momentous consequences for Andean civilizations, African civilizations and the world at large. Two conceptions of history follow, would follow from Ferrer's observation, which are in fact the two sides of our modern view of history and of society. On the one side, on the one side, the side of Andean and African civilizations, history as tragedy and the piling of catastrophes. On the other side, to a modern world history characterized by crisis, the short and long cycles of nowadays economic crisis that we often refer to as history repeating itself. After expressing his belief in the connection between great and valuable things and hot regions inhabited by darker skinned peoples, Ferrer addressed Columbus. And therefore, in my judgment, until your lordship meets such peoples, you shall fail to find an abundance of such things. Ferrer concluded that Columbus should head south at the turn of the equator, as the learned cosmographer put it in his letter. Columbus's biographers and most reputable experts in all things relating to Columbus tend to agree that the steep turn towards the equator that led him to discover South America during his third voyage was urged upon him by the sort of observations contained in Ferrer's letter. These certainties pervaded Columbus's mind at the time. Ever since, they have pervaded and informed the minds and actions of explorers, conquistadors, risk takers, financiers, and all those who call themselves owners of the land, of soil, and capital. In concatenating heat, an abundance of precious metals, and the dark skins of peoples in southern equatorial regions, like Ferrer did in his letter to Columbus, they all seem to obey a commonplace that scholars nowadays call a cosmography of riches. The term is appropriate. It refers not simply to a set of navigational problems related to what experts understand by the notion of latitude. Rather, it refers to a visual problem, what I have called the denial of edition or montage, and a philosophical problem involved in the question of Columbus's journey to the south. Few have made this problem explicit. It concerns a certain ambiguity between deeply held old cosmological assumptions concerning the nature of places and the peoples inhabiting them. The, the skies, uh, uh, as understood, you know, the sphere, the, the different spheres of uh, uh, the machina mundi, the machine of the world, as the ancient uh, 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 philosophical geographers understood them. So, an ambiguity between those old assumptions and modern ideas about the movement and circulations of things and peoples, including commodities. Both the tragedy of Andean civilizations and the repetitive nature of the history of modern globalization as a history of crisis upon crisis upon crisis can be understood as consequences, both epistemic and geopolitical, of that ambiguity. We know that geography and politics have always been allies. They were twin disciplines in the ancient cosmological tradition that imagined the orderly workings of the geocentric universe as a, as a world machine. The idea of place was crucial, par a crucial part of the tradition that witnessed the encounter between Europeans and the native peoples of the Americas. At a crucial moment in the history of mankind, these conceptions about the nature of lands climates and peoples, and also critically of the goods circulating within such places and the manner of their circulation, became an integral and explicit organizing principle of the reordering of the entire world by adding the south to the north. 
It also informed a newer sense of the accumulation of wealth, as well as the connection between such accumulation and the distribution of races north and south of the globe. Crucially, it also shaped arguments concerning the capacities of self-government of such races. In the minds of conquerors, colonizers, and financiers, geography is not merely a tool for locating, describing, or reaching the various parts of the inhabited or supposedly uninhabited parts of the world. It also justifies waging a war of races. What I'm saying is that the normalization of latitudinal or horizontal perspective, the perspective of Velazquez, the view from above, from the throne of, uh, of uh, 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 the, the, their Catholic majesties, which I will argue later on has been intensified in our era of Google Maps and 3D nosedives, was central for the normative and geographical reordering of the world and of uh, society. The contradictory geopolitical distinctions projected upon the southern latitudes soon took the form of arguments justifying the subjugation and enslavement of the peoples of the Indies rehearsed during the 16th century debates between the apologists and creators of modern imperialism, claiming legal titles to overseas colonies on the one hand, and on the other, humanitarian opponents of empire like Bartolomé de las Casas. In the process, sometime between 1539 and 1550, what we now call international law was invented, together with the very idea of nations which the Dominican friar Francisco de Vitoria divided into perfect and perfectible com communities in a way echoed today by our distinctions between developed and developing nations, and that of a republic of the whole world, thereby preparing the ground for a genuine global political <coughs> philosophy. Following French, French astrologer and cosmographer Pierre Dali, the enterprise of the Indies was designed and executed in accordance with the view that had long prevailed in the Latin West concerning the distribution of land and the arts of mankind in the planet. In this view, the view uh, put forward by Pierre Dialy, the, uh, uh, the view that uh, uh, Columbus uh, uh, shared, we know, we know that from uh, his uh, uh, diary, which was uh, recovered by none other than Bartolomé de las Casas. In that view, the three main continents, Europe, Africa, and Asia, constituted a single landmass isolated in the upper quarter of the globe, and the part of the world filled with mankind and its works was supposed to form a narrow, temperate, and thereby civilized corridor within this geographical system besieged to the north and to the south by the extreme cold and the heat of the wild Arctic and the tropics. Sub-Saharan Africa, also known as Ethiopia at the time, and the lands on the basin of the Indian Ocean, or India, soon to include all other lands that shared similar conditions because of their similar latitudinal placing, or the Indies, were thus contradictorily imagined as more or less uninhabited fringes where merciless temperatures forged the much coveted metals, silver and gold, while at the same time harboring a truly vast realm wealthier than anything Europe had seen before, precisely because such lands stood, as it was uh, uh, said at the time, in the part of the sun. Most unfortunate, writes historian of geography Nicolás Huey Gómez, uh, while longitude may speak to a technical feat that many of Columbus's contemporaries deemed impossible, latitude, again, the ground, the horizon line, speaks to a geopolitical process that Bartolomé de las Casas called the destruction of the Indies. Southing, the drive to sail south, or in today's language, to invest in emergent markets and uncover the wealth lying at the, tor at the turn of the equator, spelled the beginning of the end of such immensely rich civilizations as that of the Incas, their cultural wealth squandered or destroyed in the seemingly unstoppable search for silver and gold. However, the end never seems to have an end itself, 
as it continues to this day. Thus, we might as well speak of this catastrophe not as hell, but as purgatory. Crucially, that is precisely how Chilean sociologist Alberto Mayol describes the process of transition that has taken place in Chile after the events of 11 of September 1973 and the return of democracy. The period, he says, coincides with the establishment of the so-called model that we now know as neoliberalism, which is, of course, a misnomer. In my book, A Story About Death Foretold, on the events of 11 September 1973, the metropolitan view, the view uh, uh, represented in Velasquez's painting towards locality, what I have called the denial of montage, is assumed by two of the main characters in the unfolding tragedy. First, by the self-titled owners of Chile, the landowners and banking families ruling the country since its putative independence from European colonialism, and second by Henry Kissinger, the arch uh, uh, geostrategist uh, of our time, speaking on behalf of the US Nixon administration. The former, the owners of Chile, asserted their claim to legitimacy and thus to sovereign power and exclusive legislative capacity in fairly uncompromising terms. The sole owners of Chile are ourselves, the owners of capital and of the soil, said one of them, Eduardo Mate, a friend of uh, uh, the first Agustin Edwards in 1892. Notice that by the time this assertion is made, late 19th century, the older notion of autochthony, you know, the idea that you're sprung from the earth, has been revised to include ownership. The ground is not so much to come from the earth, though the concept of a collective identity and self-constitution as heritage, tradition and futurehood the ability to project one's heritage into the future is still crucial. It remains the very basis uh, of uh, many a constitution, uh, uh, both uh, here in Europe and in the Americas, for instance. Rather, the ground now is ownership of soil and capital and having the capacity to project ownership uh, and capital into the future as return or profit. That is what grounds sovereignty and legitimacy. From such a perspective, to undermine ownership and the accumulation of capital is an attack against our sovereignty, legitimacy and identity. Taking measures through means legal or otherwise to limit, or trans to limit markets and or transform property ownership is construed from such a standpoint as an existential threat, aiming to strike at the heart of the laws of nature and the original order. From this standpoint, whoever personifies such a threat to undermine ownership of the soil and capital can only be conceived of and presented as the Antichrist or evil incarnate. And this is precisely how Salvador Allende and the, and the social movements uh, uh, that uh, uh, brought him to power were characterized, literally. If you listen to the televised intervention of the military junta on the evening of the, of the 11th of September 1973, and all of these documents are very, most, uh, very much alive as ghosts, electromagnetic ghosts on the, on the internet, you can find them yourselves, you will hear Admiral José Toribio Merino uttering these very same words. Uh, the social movements and agenda were a cancer, and they needed to be uh, 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 extirpated. Uh, in another interview, uh, another admiral, Patricio Carvajal, who had uh, uh, coordinated the strategy of the coup on the 11th of September, uh, explicitly describes the reasons for uh, uh, and the justifications for the overthrow of Allende as he was a liar, he was the devil incarnate. You know, of course, uh, a liar and the, devil, uh, and the devil incarnate. The devil is, is uh, he who lies but we, and, and we believe in. As you can see, there is already a characterization of, of the people there as gullible, as, uh, as not uh, able to think by uh, themselves, but only to follow populist leaders. Uh, you don't have to go too far to find uh, those characterizations nowadays. Think of Hugo Chavez, who in fact returned the very, uh, the very characterization on a famous speech uh, at the United Nations. <coughs> It is therefore not only right 
but a sacred duty in accordance to certain readings of religious orthodoxy, the uh, uh, ultra-Catholicism that informed uh, those who planned the coup in Chile in 73, popular among young conservative elites in the Americas, inspired by the rise of fascism in Europe, especially in the Iberian Peninsula. That is very important. Uh, it is always forgotten, all, almost always forgotten, uh, uh, particularly by Northern Europeans, that World War II was not won everywhere, if it was won anywhere, particularly not in the Iberian Peninsula. And the massive influence of, and actually you inhabit that influence, uh, 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 the, you know, the influence architectonical, uh, intellectual, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, traveled to uh, uh, both the Luso and Hispanic speaking Americas. Um, for instance, when I studied law back in Colombia, it took me quite a while to realize that the, uh, all of the textbooks that we were presented with as uh, the orthodox in constitutional law had been written by fascist writers. Legacy, La Cambra, Carl Schmidt, uh, Morgenthau, and so on and so forth. They are still the very basis of uh, the teaching of law. Go to any uh, 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 faculty of law in Brazil and you'll find exactly the same. Not only that, that was also the inspiration for the economics of the regime. Uh, but this is another story. Uh, Chilean young conservatives did not need uh, to wait for uh, Milton Friedman to discover uh, what we now call neoliberalism. So, conservative elites in, in the Americas uh, were inspired to exorcise and extirpate such evil from the spirit of society by any means necessary. By the way, this is very important because this is the, the, the theology that is being uh, used here is uh, that of the right to rebellion. So here we have, uh, uh, and this is perhaps what is important for those of you who do sociology of protest movements, what we see here is a characterization of a movement of protest, but one that is decisively not progressive in any, uh, uh, in any sense of the term. So that's the former, the owners of uh, uh, solar land in Chile. To the latter, Kissinger and the US Nixon administration of the 1970s, this article of fate, the idea that if you undermine uh, the accumulation of property, you are going against the very, ordered, uh, the very order of the world, was, had been translated into the normative terms of a secular and global philosophy of history according to which, and here I'm citing Henry Kissinger, history has never happened and will never happen in the South. This was, uh, uh, the, uh, Kissinger uh, tells, uh, uh, utters this, this uh, uh, false truism to, uh, in 1969 to, then, uh, to the then Chilean ambassador. My argument in the book is that these two different but related standpoints coincided in the anxious context of the Americas in the 1970s and converged into a master rule, a metropolitan law of globalization with catastrophic effects for those attempting to change the tide in Chile, the global south, and the world over. We live in the shadow of that metropolitan law of globalization, of that view of the world, that image of the world, and we're also witnessing, since at least the late 1990s, the first protests and uprisings against the hold of such a law and, such, and of the perspective that grounds it. This is to say that historically and analytically speaking, we must add a third to the two well-known conceptions of democratic institutions and rights that begin with the sovereignty of a demos, the people, over a topos, a territory, a place. The latter and better known are, first, democracy as a set of decision-making procedures and institutions, and second, democracy as truth procedure. And here you can identify two very well-known schools of uh, 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 sociology and political philosophy. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, the addition of interest uh, in the mathematized uh, uh, work of, uh, say, John Elster or, or uh, 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 those who write uh, in the wake of Wilfredo Pareto, the law and economics movement in the US, for instance. Uh, democracy through procedure, well, of course, the, the latest uh, or the, one of the recent incarnations of critical theory, Jürgen Habermas's and, and John Rawls' uh, uh, notion of uh, law. In democracy as decision procedure, the term is uh, 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 I, I guess I don't need to explain to you what, what these two uh, are. Let me jump into the, onto the, the third. 
The third one is the view that places the addition or subtraction of bodies to the demos, not only public opinions or the finality of interests and desires, at the center of the operation of democratic legal institutions and the functioning of rights. Let me explain this further by pointing out that we tend to forget how law not only establishes the boundary between what we can and cannot do, as well as policing the limits, as policing the limits between order and disorder. Law also declares who counts as orderable and who doesn't. The latter, said to be lacking of any interest or future horizons of their own, a set of normal desires or the ability to calculate, are thrown into or relegated to the obscure realm of the rogue or unorderable. So law and political institutions aggregate and include, but also select and relegate. Put in deliberative terms, legal as well as political institutions not only place the rules for dialogue, they also prescribe who can take part in the conversation and who cannot. To put it uh, uh, in very simple terms, these institutions, social, legal and political, prescribe who counts as one of us. Notice, however, that this operation depends on the postulation of the not one of us, the zero, the non-being, the rogue, the abnormal, the impure, the inexistent, the cancerous. This is, in fact, an act of original displacement, of one occupying or taking the place of another. Caribbean psychiatrist and political activist Franz Fanon called this act damnation. And that's where the, the uh, uh, title of one of his uh, uh, most well-known books uh, comes from. And actually, the, the, uh, the choose of terms here is very accurate. The uh, uh, linguistic roots of the term damnation uh, go back to uh, uh, Semitic and uh, Egyptian languages and convey the image of being displaced from the land. And once you are uh, displa uh, displaced from the land, you fall. This is, of course, also a uh, reading of the books of Genesis and Exodus. You fall. And this was the reading uh, that uh, mm, uh, African peoples enslaved in the Caribbean uh, engaged in. So the zero ground of the operation that adds or subtracts bodies, uh, as well as public opinions, can be called, has been called, not a term that I particularly like, the victim, if and when compared with a beneficiary who might or might not be the same as the perpetrator. In a time and translocal sequence, this can include the successors of the perpetrators, and in a parallel but different sequences, sequence the successors of the victims. These two groups might share the same space, but in fact, they may just as well belong to different planets. They are mutually exterior occupants of the same ground. And thus, what characterizes their situation is their prior lack of relation. This is precisely how Fanon sees the colonial situation of native and settler. According to him, this is also the root of genocide. The foremost example of the genocidal uh, logic of colonialism and, uh, uh, and modern institutions is the concept of the vanishing Indian, which you can find in uh, uh, US uh, law and history, in the very US Declaration of Independence. In fact, in its federal uh, 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 constitution, which uh, uh, not once uh, names uh, uh, either the Indian or the slave, as well as pretty much every Republican constitution in the Americas, at least until the 1990s. Uh, also the restoration of slavery in the Caribbean by Napoleon during the French Revolution and the disappearance of Haitian-inspired revolutionary constitutionalism from stories and theories of constitutionalism in the Americas. The contemporary example is transitional justice and the model of economic restoration in which the market dictates public consent and law rather than the other way around the model that has been described, as I already pointed out, by Chilean sociologist Alberto Mayol. Crucially, the settlers' question is always, how can we live among these savages without civilizing them? Which means that, that for the colonial modern project of institutional democracy and human rights to get underway, to ground the subjectivity of the we on a specific model of identity, 
cells solipsistic and autonomous, living without the savages is always a solution, the final solution. Conversely, to live free from the will of the master settler is always for the native victim the imaginable outcome of a decolonizing revolutionary or transformative struggle. This is a dream, and it is very important that it is understood as such, as a feat of imagination, as another visual field, as a focus on what remains outside of the frame. It is an image that concerns the passage, the transition from the we each to the we together. It is the same image that appears in the poetry of John Milton, the rise up, the rising up of those condemned to purgatory. However, this is a dream that cannot remain as yet to come. To live free from the will of the master settler or independence does not mean simply to attain an identity in solipsistic manner. The representation of political identity as that of the negatively autonomous individual is based on a solipsistic model that turns out to be the model of the soul and the eternity of the soul and or the eternity of peoples who uh, uh, move from one place to another. We should denounce that political theological model as inadequate to think society, law, and politics. This is the case not because religion has no place in politics, I happen to think it has, but rather because it is folk politics based upon a folk psychology, a set of erroneous beliefs about individuals and processes of subjectivation. Unfortunately, that model, postulating the eternity of a people's soul as it transits from one period of crisis to another, or from one place to another, is still very much alive, very much with us. For instance, in most accounts and practices of transitional justice, but also in the operation of constitutional adjudication that relate to the political realities of indigenous and Afro-Latin American peoples in that part of the world, uh, and or in uh, the mainstream language uh, concerning uh, austerity and economic crisis. I mean, notice the, uh, the clear uh, theological and moralistic tones of that language, austerity, meaning you have to endure, you have to go through the, the pain of, uh, of uh, uh, economy, an economic crisis as if it were a, judge, a, a sort of inquisitorial, inquisitorial judgment with, which will prove whether or not you're worthy in your case, of belonging to Europe. Because, by the way, you have been colonized. Uh, I don't know if you have noticed, but uh, you ha Europe is colonizing itself. The language which you hear in Germany or in, or in Britain among bankers, which is supposed to explain uh, the, your plight, is homologous, not analogous, homologous to the language that was used in order to justify uh, the subservience of other peoples. You're supposed to be spendthrift, lazy, you do not work because it is too hot. So, well, of course, you only have yourselves to blame. That's the idea. If we must speak of uh, uh, that uh, uh, language, that is staging as a drama, the drama of freedom, then we must consider the theatrical as well as the visual element in the social theory of political and legal institutions in relation to real politics, which for me is the politics of protest, the struggle and actual transformation. To do that, first we must consider the kind of visual normality that provides the model of the isolated individual and the eternity of the soul of a transiting, suffering people, and thus an entire field of political sociology and legal theory, with the illusion of being grounded in reality. The creation of linear perspective, a visual and pictorial technology, as well as a technique of geographical governance and time management, laid the groundwork upon which the edifice of modern law and politics, but also economics, was built. And the invention of the horizon, played a central role in that creation. Therefore, before we engage in conversation and to begin to conclude, I will leave you, at least for now, with my very own brief history of the horizon.
a sense of time and space has changed dramatically. Technologies of surveillance, AOD, gaming, smartphones, and Google Maps give us access to what used to be called a God's idea. And so increased feeling of dominion over the globe's geography. As we come to occupy God's view, we feel more human than human, sovereign subject. But as the perspective is supplemented by the virtual nose dives of drones, prisons, software, and CCTV <coughs> cameras, we become objects of surveillance to a degree never thought possible before. The ground shifts beneath our feet. But how did this happen? Rising played a crucial role in the story. A traditional sense of orientation, space, and time is based on the stable position of a navigator or a painter located on a ground of sorts, the beach, a boat. Early on, Arab navigators used their fingers with to establish their position. They called it shooting an object. The technique was taken up by painters in Europe and later on by Hollywood. Between the 13th and 15th centuries, Arab books on visual theory spawned a series of experiments that culminated in the invention of linear perspective and crucially, Columbus's and Cabral's expeditions to the Americas. Whichever's 1496 miracle aligned perspective in one single vanishing point located on a visual horizon, but the theme was an anti-Semitic story. In their perspective, declared the view of a one-eyed observer as the norm. This view was assumed to be natural and scientific. In fact, it flattens and computes the space creating the illusion of a view through the real outside. Perspective means precisely to see through. The space of linear perspective is that by definition calculable, navigable, and predictable. Future risk can now be anticipated and managed. The art of government was born, also finance, and with it, modern economics. In 1492, Columbus said to the Americas, using linear perspective. international law. That same year, 1492, Jews and Muslims were expelled from Spain and Portugal, thrown into the outside. Now we have the wretched of the earth. The linear perspective is a trick, as the whole field of vision converges in, in the one-eyed viewer, he becomes central to the worldview established by it. This is the view from above, the view of Leviathan, a demi-god like the Cyclops Polyphemus, who according to the story went blind. Inventing the subject, time, and space in this way provided a toolkit for Western domination, also the domination of its concepts. 
In Uccello's 1469 painting, which preceded Columbus's expedition on the expulsion of Jews and Muslims by only a few years, Lina expected the constant matrix for racial and religious propaganda. Shakespeare made it a theme in his 1598 play, The Merchant of Venice. Modern racial and religious dogma only makes sense in a world made all by capitalism and cannot be understood without it. Perspective also makes for great theater, and without it, no narrative, no novel, and no critique. Between 1756 and 1796, critical philosopher Immanuel Kant taught geography. The space is the ground of all intuitions, he wrote. The subjective ground of differentiation. This is a pictorial notion, based on the optical illusion of the image plane as a window opening onto the outside real world. Can they replace the moral authority placed with the pictorial authority? But the emphasis in both cases is on authority. Being able to see through time and space means appropriating that. In 1802, Kant wrote the nations of the Southern Hemisphere are situated at the lowest level of humanity. In 1840, Turner painted the slave ship. The scene represents a real incident, also an infamous legal case, when the captain of a slave ship song discovered that his city of London insurance only covered the slaves lost at sea, not those dying on board. He ordered all sick and thirsty slaves to be thrown overboard. Turner captured the moment. The horizon line is curved, is stable, the spectator is displaced and upset beside himself at the sight of the slaves beginning to drown. The limbs severed by sharks, their bodies reduced to fragments and debris. Turning this other space into the mayhem of big money made in an unstable and predictable sea. After him came cinema, further accelerating and dismantling in a perspective and in its way cubism, abstract painting, monta, and the surrealist paintings of Chilean muralist and Allende supporter Roberto Mata. In 1971, he painted a mural, the first goal of the Chilean people, together with the muralist brigades. A celebration of football, sexuality, and people's power. He marked the election of Salvador Allende as president in 1970. A year before the election, U.S. Security Advisor Henry Kissinger to the Chilean ambassador. History will never happen in the South. After the coup, the first goal was painted over with 16 coats of white paint. However, its spirit lives on in painting in the cinema of Guzman and Jodorowsky. More recently, in the actions of those who since 2011 have been reclaiming the city streets of London, Cairo, New York, Santiago and Rio de Janeiro as sites of transformation and self-realization. They recognize in Google Maps, cyberspace laws and internet surveillance an intensified global class war from above seen through the lenses and on the screen of military entertainment and information industries. But just as linear perspective began to tumble down with the sinking bodies of the slaves, and then again in the 60s and 70s, so today the new tools of vision and the statutory surveillance state may serve to destabilize simulated grounds. The time has come to dispel the illusion that we need a ground in the first place. To summarize and conclude, only the disappearance of the all-seeing observer and his imaginary stable ground, the vanishing of the heroic knower and the sovereign subject might open up the normative dimension of fidelity and truthfulness that corresponds to groundless knowledge seen through pro uh, projective lenses and on screens. To me, that is precisely the significance of Agenda's death. The interruption of the Chilean revolution, a revolution through law, and his becoming electromagnetic debris or ghost, or a ghost, gathered and intensified for us on the web. The counter revolution, is still ongoing in spite of its proven failure, embraces a rule of law and economics that commands the mapping and surveillance of entire regions of thought, time, and space, ultimately, the world and the future. In our time, the proxy perspective projects delusions of stability, security, and extreme mastery onto a backdrop of expanded 3D sovereignty. It recreates societies in imagination as free-falling urban abysses and splintered terrains of occupation, 
surveilled aerially or virtually on the internet and policed via politically. The grounded observer, the sovereign subject who organizes and flattens all that can be seen on the surface of the earth, glides seamlessly from one locality to the next and from one time of crisis to the next. It traverses the homogeneous empty time like a wave moving through the crowd. This insight on what I have called the denial of montage or the view from above, developed in the wake of and in place of linear perspective, is especially relevant to the sociology of protest movements as well as to the study of relations between metropolitan centers and, say, Africa or Latin America as the rest, in the sense given to this term by Paula Meneses or uh, Jean and John Komarov. For instance, in my study of the social movements articulated in the popular unity uh, movement that came, uh, the popular unity coalition that came to power in 1970s Chile, it became crucial to ask the question, what turns a movement into a liberatory movement, an emancipatory one, an oppositional one? The question matters precisely because there were many movements at the time in Chile, uh, as, as uh, uh, now, I believe, that call themselves protest movements, but should then, as now, be rightly called reactionary or outright fascist, as Allende put it in his final address on 11 September 1973. In his final words, which uh, we have because they were turned into electromagnetic debris and were intensified on the internet, Allende also called for a unity of orientation in coming protest movements. Does this mean the mere addition of elements taken to result in the equivalent chain of desires and claims we often call the voice of the people? My answer in this talk has been negative. For the additive principle that constitutes the unitary gaze or will in this case is never problematized. Here, the unity of gaze or the voice of the people does not allow for breaks or cuts, for montage, for addition. Images and positions are linked without reflection in a movement of blind, horizontal and vertical inclusion. In its breathless transgress transgression of existing conditions and identities, it leaves the situation as it was before. In contrast, I have argued that instead of a mere addition of elements for the sake of translocal reproduction of the status quo, in the case of the Chilean revolution, we find a different movement of political montage. One which I have tried to uh, uh, express both in video and in uh, the installation before you, which we can discuss later on. This was a different movement of political montage, one that held on to the principle according to which we must courageously pound two dull stones together to create a spark in the long night of empire. Here I'm invoking uh, the language of uh, filmmaker Hito Steyer, an American pragmatist philosopher and uh, uh, holder of the prophetic tradition, Cornel West. We can call this the spark of hope, as Cornel West does. This is also the spark of the political, and it is illuminating the streets of Santiago, Rio de Janeiro, London, Cairo, and I hope Coimbra and Lisbon once more fairly soon. Thank you.